Thank you. Good day, everyone. This is Zanda Hilger, and I coordinate the North Central Texas and the Dallas Area Agency on Aging, uh, those two Area Agency on Aging, the North Central Texas Caregiver Teleconnection in partnership with the Wellman Foundation in San Antonio. They host it, they provide the outstanding technical assistant assistance, and uh, we partner on this. Our topic today, and it is being recorded if you want to look back at it or refer friends to it, our topic today is communicating more effectively with healthcare providers in the office. Now, what this means is every month for the next few months, we're going to focus on the important role that family caregivers play in the medical care of our loved ones. And we're starting with in the office, and then we will be moving through what happens in the hospital, and especially the, the unique roles of people like the care manager. I'm right now waiting for a confirmation for a social worker, care manager, caseworker. They have a lot of different names for next month. And I'll be referring you to a lot of, of information. What, I guess the reason why I decided that I would provide this one is that since about mid-year last year, my husband's chronic back pain had um, gotten much worse to the point that he he had had a surgery in 2003 on his um, lumbar spine, but he continued to have back pain and he uh, is on a pain management program, but nothing was making any difference. So after much physical therapy, the our specialist, uh, pain management specialist and surgeon suggested that his only option really was surgery or learn to live with it because he was almost topped out on the medications that he could take because he's been dealing with this for 23 years, he has been on drugs for many, many years, and the tolerance is building up to where it is not always, um, it, it's getting to the point where it wasn't healthy. Now, my husband was an extreme athlete. He was a runner and a weightlifter and a rock climber and um, many different forms of physical activity. He played um, high school football played a lot of sports, and he is definitely the result of a lot of extreme sports. And he now is 71. He was 70 when he had his surgery. So the most recent block of time that I'm going to be referring to is started on November the 3rd. And that's when he had a seven-hour um what they call a 360 surgery, meaning that they went in from the front, uh, moved organs over to work on his spine from the front, closed that up, and then went and worked on the lumbar sp spine from the back. Who would have thought that that ended up being the, le the least compl complicated of the last three months? He had a fairly... Um, quick and easy comparatively of his surgery. He was in post-op for about four days in a hospital we've used before, and we have a lot of uh, confidence in them. As a matter of fact, I've already written a, a letter recognizing I got a list of all his texts and all his nurses. Uh, we felt like they did a very good job. He was discharged to a rehab facility uh, about mid-November. And on the second day, he fell in his room using his walker and had a has a laceration that opened up about three and a half inches from hitting his head on the floor. Well, many of you know that a, a head injury, there's lots of blood. Since that time, I had to write them down so I wouldn't overlook them. Since that time, he has broken the three vertebrae above his, where they did the surgery up lumbar one through five. 
he um, took a spill in the hospital because one of the, the uh, uh, physical therapists forgot to plug in the, the um, a security device. He had broke his hip, and that's uh, why he's in rehab again right now. He broke his ankle, also requiring surgery, and he broke his fibula. Now, all of his blood work indicates that there's no specific problem with his bones. He's having a balance problem. He's having, he completely believes he's had a concussion. All right, so what does this have to do with today's topic? We're going to focus today on what happens in the office and what can we as family members, as family caregivers do to make our responsibility and our job in the office um, as effective as possible. And part of the reason for that is, as, as we all know, a patient may go to the hospital, but then in, as in Chuck's case, he had surgery, so there's follow-up surgery, and if he is in rehab, that means a lot of moving parts of having transport. There's just a lot of moving parts to the care of someone who is um, who, who has had a chronic illness or is having to meet a lot of these appointments. What I've asked um, Minerva has sent you today is... From our communicate from our family caregivers online website that is sponsored by the Area Agency on Aging of Dallas and North Central Texas, and what we're doing is we're going to go through this. And the reason why we feel that this is a valuable piece of information for you is it's got a lot of tools. I know many of you um, maybe don't like the idea of planning; it's just not in your personality. But if we have to be a caregiver, we soon find that there's a, an element of caregiving. We have to learn to plan regardless. So what I would like to do is we're going to start with trying to get to the view screen so I can share my screen. Okay. And again, this is uh, the North Central Texas and Dallas Area Agency on Aging. They both um, sponsor this website through family caregiver uh, dollars that are federal funded. Well, come on. Where is it? All I want to do is view screen. That's all I need to do. Hey, it's a Monday. I often wonder, why did I choose Monday to do these? We've been doing them for about five years now. I think that's correct. Okay, share screen. And here we go. All right, can somebody confirm whether or not you are seeing something that is uh, communicating with healthcare providers? Anyone? I can see your Google search for it, yes. Okay, so you can see uh, that that screen that says, and there's a, a man and a woman's picture and then communicating with healthcare providers. That's what you're seeing. No. Just want to make sure. Okay, excellent. Not seeing that one. Not seeing that one. All righty. We do these all the time. I just get very frustrated with, Sometimes it could be a different tab. Well, that's it's got to be a different tab. Stop, stop. Nope, nope, that's not it. Come on. I think I'll just add it to this one. Right. We're at least are seeing family caregivers online. Oh dear. My coworkers are four legged. I'm gonna shut the door. And I often describe them as their slackers. 
they're usually very quiet and easy to have around. And sometimes they are not. Oh, I know how the best way to get to this. I'm sorry, folks. It, it's on my screen. But you know how that goes. I sometimes think I need an assistant when it comes to these. But poor Minerva is in San Antonio. So let's see. And actually, this is not that unusual for what happens. I have been my husband's primary caregiver uh, starting since last summer. And I have diabetes. And about two months ago, I have to go in routinely, about two months, months ago, I went in for blood work and um, my A1C was at 8.3, which anyone knows anything about, here we go, knows anything about diabetes, knows that that is a um, very high number. And so she put, uh, my PA put me on, here we go, put me on Trulicity, and many of you may have heard of that. It is designed to, for uh, primarily to help those who are, um, who have type two diabetes to help them manage their blood sugar. There, now we just gotta see it. Uh, manage their blood sugar, and also uh, usually they lose weight. Well, what happened in my case is I started taking it, my blood sugar dropped a point, and I lost uh, much needed, I needed to lose some weight. So I lost some weight, my A1C started going down. The problem is, you two problems. Number one, you can't it's hard to reach it, to get it up here because people are using it for weight loss. And many of you have seen the commercials about that. Plus my insurance company changed over in uh, January and it is not honoring, it's not considering that clinically necessary, even though what my A1C is uh, dangerously high. So what does that have to do with anything? What that has to do with is that um, my memory is not what it should be. And my um, thinking is not what it should be because I've been full-time caregiver and taking care of our home. And, uh, you know, things happen in your home, especially in four or five months, like plumbing problems and dog problems and you know, things just happen. So I apologize for my hiccups this morning, but I think we're there. Can you see the screen? This is communicating with healthcare providers. Are we there? Yes. Excellent. This is on the web, our website. And I wrote some of this. I edited some of this, but you'll see at the very top, um, quick topic, quick links. And what we're going to especially uh, focus on is those doctor visits and communicating. All of you who are caregivers know how much of a challenge it is to coordinate the health care, the doctor visits for our loved one, including just getting them there. And very often you have to wait a long time to get an appointment, although those with, with chronic illnesses, it's usually not as much as a, of a problem because they, they almost are scheduled one after another. But getting them there, and many of you work or you have children or teenagers at home, and so it's this constant um, sh gr uh, juggling act. So doctor visit pointers and again this is on your on uh, what you got from Minerva today and let's start with pointers for visits to the doctor one of the critical parts of care is to make sure that we're keeping very accurate records that are all of the contact information all of the um, insurance information and not only that you have it 
perhaps in something portable that you can carry with you, but you've got to have it each and every time. It's especially helpful also if you will um, uh, update that and carry it with you wherever you go. Here is, this, is a document that we found, and it is in Word format, which I love because you can type on it. The problem that I always have with the with PDF files is you can't type. You have to print it off and then handwrite it. And that's not something that I particularly like. I was also my mother's uh, primary caregiver. She had um, many illnesses most of her life, and she also had uh, chronic depression. So she had several do uh, doctors, and I was her caregiver also. And I got to where every time we went to a new doctor, as you know, we have all these forms to fill out. What we've provided for you if, is that we've gone through and tried to find all the data elements that need to go on one uh, piece of paper that you can have pre-prepared. Now, does that mean that that's going to be used, that they won't make you fill out theirs? They may, but at least you've got it all there in front of it, in front of you, including something like blood type, emergency contact, uh, who the relationship is, the insurance, any supplemental insurance, um, even instructions on the back of the uh, insurance card is usually where you'll find those customer service numbers, phone numbers. I think I know all those by heart by now. Primary care physician, the hospital, your hospital of choice, pharmacy, um, because this year our uh, pharmacy services changed over. I now have two because some of the medications that between Chuck and me that we need um, even though it's not on the insurance of our former pharmacy, it actually is cheaper because of their discount card than what the insurance will pay. So check those things out. And of course it's in your spare time, right? The hospital that you choose, any other doctors. And the beauty again of a, of a Word document like this is you can add as many lines as you need so that you can keep adding all of those uh, professionals. Another thing that's real important, I'm sure you have been at the hospital and you've been asked, is do you, do you, do you know where his power of attorney is? Uh, do you have that? They will ask you to, to, they will ask that family member to fill out a HIPAA form. Whatever you can do, especially if it's the same hospital or the same doctor that you're using, whatever you can do to have all of those doc documents in the file in the doctor's office, please take care of that. Medical power of attorney, directive to physicians and, sur and surrogates, that directive physicians is what we all know as, um, as the living will. Uh, the DNR do not resuscitate. The physician actually um, completes that, but it's always good to have a copy of it. Have these forms with you at all times. Our doctor and our hospital has all of these forms for both Chuck and me, but it, it certainly makes it easier if I already have a copy that I can just take out of any file, uh, three ring binder, whatever. We are at the point where I have a three ring binder and each of the tabs is another physician. Whatever works for you. All right, medical history allergies and known reactions, hospitalizations, procedures, and surgeries. Oh my goodness, especially when our um, loved one is older and has had many of these. And again, if you've got this uh, Word document, you can keep adding this information. If you prefer, you could just take some of these headings or number them, maybe say medical history, and just write all of this out. Either you've typed it or you've written it out, whatever works for you. There is no right or wrong way to do this. It is tedious and it's constantly changing. And that's the beauty of having it in some kind of electronic format because you can change it or add to it, maybe not change, but update it as you go along. Now in Chuck's case, we will have, uh, they put what they call a cage around his L5, L1 through five 
that is a combination of surgical glue and cadaver dust. Who knew? And of course, we'll have that year. And he also has had all of these other breaks. So he's got quite a bit of hardware now. Immunizations, good place to put that. Family history, also a good place to put. In his case, his sleep has been really horrible. He does have a CPAP at home, but he had problems with it in the facility. So you can see this is pretty thorough, including personal habits. Um, did he smoke? He did not. Um, what are his religious beliefs or whatever? And again, this is almost like the master file that you can have with you for the doctor visit. And then it carries over into any hospital stays also. And here are instructions of, of how to use it. And this section is extremely important. Spend the time looking at this. A lot of the, the instructions here actually have come out of a lot of uh, uh, weather disasters, especially Katrina. The idea of having records that are portable and being able to get to them. Um, having a power of attorney or medical power of attorney and only and your only um, copy is at bank is not very helpful when you walk into an emergency room. So make sure that you keep copies of this handy. All right, so there is that form that we hope will be very beneficial for you. Okay, now we got to go to the next one. All right. Hey, look how easily that worked. Okay. Doctor office visit pointers. Second tab there, be clear about what you want to say to the doctor. Avoid rambling or what some people call the rabbit trail. I think you would, if we did a poll right now of all of you, you would say that your actual time with that physician or even a PA is probably three to five minutes if there's a severe issue or a chronic issue or post-op and maybe there needs to be some x-rays done in the office that might get longer but healthcare has become very much uh, a clock watchers exercise be clear about what you want don't ramble. Stay focused. What is your goal, your goal for that visit today? And what that means is you will have had a, time, a chance to observe your loved one, to understand what they need, and you have to ask them. Caregivers are uh, have a habit of assuming things about what their family member needs. And we can't always communicate with a family member because either they can't speak very clearly or they have dementia which impairs their thinking so it's very important to have some kind of communication and that we do a better job of observing plan what to ask write your questions down and again here are your here's the pdf file patient name doctor name what is the reason for this appointment appointment it says my symptoms, it's their symptoms. But again, we lifted this from somewhere else. Questions I want to ask and I being the caregiver. What does the doctor say? Now there is a, uh, this is a PDF file, but there also is a Word file. So if you had the Word file, you could be typing this in once you get home. But in the office, you don't maybe have that luxury. Although more and more family members are taking their own laptop. And many of you have doctors that already have a scribe or someone who comes in with them who takes the note so that the physician concentrates on the patient. Uh, you're going to have these, uh, the vitals probably taken. Yes, you will have them taken, not necessarily their height, but their weight, their temperature. All these are pretty standard. Now, what would be the advantage of that? In Chuck's case, there were a couple of weeks where his pain was uh, hard to manage and it was affecting his blood pressure to the point where his blood pressure was starting to get um, 
way too high. And there was discussion about medication, but it did uh, regulate itself. And that first started in the, in that, um, in the office itself. My to-do list, as the physician is talking and you're making notes, including changes to medications, any recommendations, what notes are you making to yourself? What do I need to do differently? And this was also where I very often was making um, lists of what I needed to take care of. And that was quite helpful. This particular document, this PDF, it is formatted to where if you print it off, it's in two pages. So you have plenty of room, uh, you have plenty of room to write information. All right, let's keep going. Bring your list of medications. And I hope all of you that are listening um, are already doing this. There is no way I'm going to write all of Chuck's medications. And here's another point too. As long as Chuck can do it himself, I'm really making him more dependent on me if I do everything. There was a time when he was post-op and he wasn't thinking real clearly and still on a lot of those medications. He was having a lot of problem processing information. So I definitely did this. We had a laugh uh, a couple of weeks ago because he uh, said, can you call, and I don't even recall exactly who it was. I it was the uh, um, durable medical equipment company. Can you call... And there was kind of a pause and I said, couldn't you do that? And there was just, he didn't say anything. And then we both started laughing. And this happens with caregivers is we are so used to doing everything for our loved one that even where they have recovered to the point that they can do that for themselves, neither one of us think about it now. Realize that many of the people that we care for, they are no longer capable my mother was intelligent. She um, was a go-getter in many, many ways, but she just stopped doing things for herself. And in the beginning, it was because she was really honest about it. She didn't want to do it anymore. That was why I was around. So I did all the record keeping and all the paperwork. But as long as we can keep our loved one engaged, it's good for them, um, their brain, but again, there may be too many limitations due to the illness, due to medication, or uh, the illness that may involve some form of dementia. Don't hesitate to ask questions and expect clear answers. And we're going to go into, uh, uh, in a little while, some of the ways that you can communicate. Take those notes. Now, one question, one phrase before we go any further that I think we need to be very careful about. Um, why did you give my loved one X medication? Why aren't you changing that? I learned, I have a master's in counseling and I've taught caregiver education programs and, and human relations for many, many years. And I learned this, um, on my own, I learned it in classes, but also watched how people communicated. When you start a question with why, almost certainly the person requesting it either A, doesn't know why, or B, there's a little bit of a tendency to get defensive. How come you're asking me this? But there are other ways that you can get the information like who, what, when, where, how. Be very careful about some of the language you use, especially the word why. All right, take your notes. Quick tips for partnering with medical providers. If necessary, you may have to make a separate appointment. Now, some insurance companies will not approve this, but that would be an area that you could make a direct call to your insurance company. My experience is once I talk to a human being, um, they will definitely tell me what they can and cannot do, but there also are sometimes flexibility 
that you can get that. And frankly, you're just going to say, I didn't have a clue what that doctor was talking about. Uh, I needed to get her. I knew she, she was getting very um, fidgety or my dad was obviously a lot more confused than me. I need an appointment that's separate and you'll probably have to schedule that. So be prepared though. If there is a consulting appointment, probably maybe on the phone, what are your, your questions and concerns? Uh, another thing about telemedicine is that it's a good use of the doctor's time and very often yours also. The next bullet point there, learn the routine of the doctor's office. I think you all would admit or you all have seen from experience what happens right there as soon as you walk in the door and the folks that are uh, answering the phone, they have a lot to do. And I don't know if you've noticed it, it's certainly true in our world, is that these folks have too much to do, a lot of it paperwork, and not enough staff for it. Another um, observation I've made is it seems that everywhere from doctor's offices to the hospitals to routine, uh, uh, retail stores, everywhere, the person using the computer say, I'm so sorry, but it's just gotten slower and slower. Well, I have a theory that it's because the software folks continue to develop software to make the records easy to access. Um, they're also adding more graphics. But I don't know that thoughts have been given to upgrading the hardware, the actual computer itself or the hard drive. And so it starts to slow down. And I know it becomes frustrating for everyone. And reflect that back to that staff person. You know, I certainly understand what you're dealing with. I have that problem too. I'll just wait. Even though you're just can't wait to get out of there, there's there's not anything they can do except just keep trying. I asked at the rehab center the last couple of days if they would print a copy of my husband's um, medication list because, oh, by the way, when he was transferred from the hospital, he was post-op and they left one of his day-to-day -day pain medications off the list. It was 22 hours before we could resolve that because he was transferred on a Friday, our his pain management doctor had already left the office. They had to call um, uh, the uh, rehab center's consulting doctor. It's been a mess. And it took till this morning when I called pain management doctor and she faxed over what his normal daily protocol was. So get to know staff in the office, get to know Remember, they may not hear as often as they need. Thank you. And I know you're working hard to help us. I'm so sorry that uh, this is taking so much time for you. You have to just be compassionate with people. Be compassionate. And that means also for us, how many times are you pausing to take a deep breath? Pick something in a room or in the waiting room or once you're in the exam room to look at and just take a deep breath. Just take a deep breath. Uh, ask if you can contact the nurse. In our case, our primary care physician, we have, uh, there is a system they have. If we have questions, then I call and I ask if the, uh, a, a message, an instant message can go directly to the nurse. She may not be able to check those until the end of the day, but at least that information has gone back to her because it may be days before the doctor themselves might be able to um, uh, answer whatever issue or question you have. Find out if you, the physician will see patients in a nursing or rehab facility. Now, most of the facilities have uh, a contractor who is a specialist physician as in the case with my husband and his pain medicines. It, they had to call, and it was on a Friday night, they had to call um, their consulting pain management. But it would be a good idea to know whether or not your loved one's physician, specialist, sees people in the nursing facility. In our case, 
the hospitalist, and that's a whole different issue, but the hospitalists are the doctors in the facility. And uh, with my, one of my husband, I think it was the second rehab facility, the hospitalist that he had in the hospital also saw patients in um, the rehab facility. So there was some uh, at least crossover there. Explore the idea of end of life. Have you explored that, discussed that with your loved one? It may not be an issue right now, and it would be kind of irrelevant and making a huge uh, um, assumption to even start talking about that. But is it something that does need to be discussed, especially if your loved one has a chronic illness, a terminal illness, or they have a, a form of dementia, that there is going to come a point where they no longer can make informed decisions. So it's uncomfortable to talk about. Of course it is. But do you want to kick this down the road, this whole issue to the point where uh, it's so much more stressful? And so it may be this is something to talk about. Now, word of caution. <clears throat> This may not be an issue you will talk to a physician about in front of your loved one. My mother kicked me out of going into the exam room. She said, I talk too much, translated as I ask questions. And she was withholding information from the doctor because uh, she was taking too many uh, pain meds. And she didn't want me to say or do anything that would stand in the way of her having access. Um, what I got in the habit of doing is I respected she didn't want me in there. But I also knew that her doctor needed to know everything that was going on with her. This is not necessarily about end of life. So I got in the habit. I would type up in bullet points the observations that our family had noticed, what I had experienced about her, how she was acting, or if she was having, she was having recurrent UTIs, and she'd gotten to where she just didn't want to admit to a lot of things. And I'm sure many of you listening in have had a loved one do that. They don't want to admit to anything happening because of their fear that they might be put into a hospital Many of them have the fear of ultimately that they're going to be placed in a nursing home or a rehab facility or even assisted living. And so they'll hide information. So just make sure you're being observant and that you report the facts to, uh, to your loved one's physician. And again, the facts, not your opinion. With the UTI, there's lab work that can be done. And many of you probably know men and women have uh, can develop UTIs. And sometimes UTIs can mimic so many other illnesses. Some people that are having a UTI, especially a severe one, may have symptoms that mimic dementia or Alzheimer's. And um, I had a very dear friend who constantly had UTIs, so she was always on a low level of, of an antibiotic. But that last bullet, make sure you discuss end-of-life issues. I know I went off on another trail, but that certainly is Im important information, what I just talked about. Okay, recommendations for, for clear communication. Several years ago, there was something called an evidence-based practice program for communicating more effectively with healthcare workers that was researched and was adopted around the country and uh, caregivers were being trained in how important effective communication and clear communication. Some of the bullet points in this section we've already discussed, but let's briefly go over them and on your own, you can spend more time there. The first sentence, of course, it's true. Practicing clear communication will help you be a more effective caregiver and a better advocate for the person in your care because good communication helps people clear up misunderstandings and communicate and confusion quickly. It builds positive relationships and leads to better care. Call the person by name, meaning the nurse, the doctor, and introduce yourself. Uh, good morning, Dr. Phelps. 
I'm Zanda Seberg and I'm primary caregiver for Chuck here. Um, I'm here to answer questions. I've got here some observations that that we've made, that the family's made, if you take if you'd care to take a look at that. But I am his primary caregiver. What happened over time with my mom is I would fax over that list. And I'll never forget the day that the doctor came out into the waiting room and she said, I cannot tell you how helpful it was to have that information on there. And you didn't say she does have, you just said, this is what we're seeing. And she said, this certainly saved me a lot of time because I could follow up on that. All right, second bullet, use facts rather than opinions or, ass or assumptions to describe medical problems. Say something like mother has been coughing too for two weeks rather than I think she has bronchitis. Well, you don't know whether she has bronchitis. Yes, she may have had it before. This may be a chronic problem, but they need the symptoms, not the diagnosis. Let them decide about the diagnosis. But whatever you can do uh, to give them the symptoms, including things like what time of the day is there, uh, does it happen before meals, after meals, just try to observe and jot down as much detail as you can that's fact-based, not based on your opinion. The third bullet, make eye contact with every person in the medical profession. Realize that some cultures are not as uh, familiar with that, and some personalities are not as comfortable with eye contact. Um, but it is as important as possible making eye contact with the physician, the nurse, the aide, the person that's taking blood pressure, the person that is taking blood, making eye contact. And if you see a name, call them by name and, you know, make a statement. I hope you're having a good afternoon. Make a connection with everyone that's providing care to your loved one, as well as they're providing care to you by the information they provide. The next bullet, stay in the moment. Another problem with that rabbit tra trail and not staying on uh, focused is people will start talking about, well, three weeks ago, da, 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 but that is that relevant to right now. Stay in the moment. I think that term breathe deeply needs its own bullet because throughout any doctor visit, a caregiver is probably gonna need to do a series of deep breaths, breathing very deeply in and out. There is another evidence-based um, training program and it's free. It's done through, uh, through area agencies on aging, through hospitals, and it is uh, called a matter of balance. It's primarily focusing on helping older adults learn uh, better ways to maintain balance, but it's also things as important as uh, what are techniques that someone can use if they fall and there's no one around to help them, um, exercises that people can do at home. And of course, uh, the disclaimer is check with your doctor before you do this, but it's a very powerful program. I've seen it do wonders for people. So I would encourage you talk to the Area Agency on Aging, the WellMed, uh, call the um, um, Social Security office. There will be a listing of this program and it's called uh, A Matter of Balance, A Matter of Balance. And it's uh, when they use the term um, evidence-based, that means it is based on research. Establish rapport. Make everybody feel comfortable. You don't feel comfortable. You're nervous, but you are helping someone and the people, the professionals, they are helping someone because they got into this business because they're healthcare providers. So try to find whatever is a common ground. Establish some rapport. Reach out. Um, be human with them. And you might be surprised how your kindness and your courtesy might go a long way in helping that provider um, be more relaxed and just have a moment that they don't feel like they are uh, have to be 
110%, but they can do their job a little bit more relaxed because you are. So establish some rapport. Maintain a strong sense of self. Now, what does that mean? Well, what that means is your role as a family caregiver is extremely important. There is a graphic that a matter of balance uh, provides, and it's not a hierarchy of at the top is the doctor, and then it's the, the patient or the client, and then it's all these medical people, and you're kind of going, yeah, but where's the family? Well, this graphic that a matter of balance has, it's a circle, and the patient is right in the middle, and then the family caregiver is another one of the spokes on a wheel because it does take a bill, a village. And when you leave that office, those doctors, nurses, and everybody else, they're not going home with you. So why it's so important that you learn as much as you can, you get questions answered, you take notes, and you are going to feel a lot more confident and a lot more prepared than if you just feel like um, you're over here to the side and uh, they're just telling you what what you should do because very often they're they're following the protocol what usually works with most patients and it may not work with your loved one the next bullet be prepared think about your goals for your appointment we've already talked about this but this is one of the the um, important points for a, a matter of balance what are your goals for the appointment are you prepared to take notes uh, think a few minutes before you even leave to go and pick up your loved one or get them into the car. What do we want to accomplish? That will also help you stay focused so you're not rambling back to two or three weeks ago. You're staying focused on what's going on right now. The next bullet, clearly state your purpose. Give the reason why you need their help today. It may be that, well, this is a chronic uh, condition and we're having this again. Um, I'm concerned about her overall well-being. I have noticed uh, um, some blood in her urine, whatever. But your purpose is we're here to find out what may be going on. And again, if your loved one, like my mother, she didn't want these things discussed. She was very private anyway. So I got in the habit. I did those bullet points. I left it for the doctor. If I happened to be at work that day, I would fax it to them. And her physician found that was very helpful because it gave her something to check out. She wasn't, um, I wasn't telling her, we think, you know, we think she has a UTI. We we're saying, this is what we've noticed. This is what she's experiencing. And then it's up to her what she does with that information. Again, stay focused on the current problem, the current issue the treatments that the loved one is going through, or maybe they've just finished some treatment and any follow-up. Some of the meeting or the appointments you go to are follow-up. Tomorrow, Chuck has an appointment with, uh, with the surgeon who uh, fixed his ankle and also operated on his hip. And so tomorrow is a follow-up. And right now, the only information we think is relevant is especially at night he is um, ankle in his leg um, that he that he broke that fibula it aches at night which may be perfectly normal but it's something that the doctor needs to be aware of offer relevant information the most important information first don't know if you've ever um, heard this term before but in journalism uh, in classes, you're taught to write in a reversed, a reverse pyramid style, meaning the most important statement is at the very top. So the most important information is with our visit tomorrow will be at night, Chuck is going to be telling the surgeon, and that's another thing, as long as he can tell that story. I'm going to back away. That's not always the case. Or as in my mother's case, she wasn't telling the exact truth. But what he's going to be doing is I find at night, just before I go to sleep, I have a lot of ache in my leg. 
And that gives him a chance to communicate that and the physician a chance to address that particular um, issue. Avoid information that's not current or relevant. Again, don't get started on, um, you know, he just got over a urinary tract infection or something that's just not relevant to today's visit. What do you want to accomplish today? Because you have a short amount of time and you want to walk out of there with something uh, doable. Be assertive without being aggressive, without being rude or overbearing. Explain needs and what you are not able to do, what you're not able to do. Be assertive. I think of the movie, and many of you may not have seen this movie, but it's Shirley MacLaine and uh, Wagner, Wagner. Anyway, Shirley MacLaine is the mother. Her daughter has terminal cancer. She's in the hospital, and they had called... Shirley McLean had called for the pain medication and it didn't come and it didn't come. So there is a scene where she leaps up, goes out of the room and starts pounding on the counter. Give her the shot, give her the shot, give her the shot. And one nurse said, she's not my patient. I'm sorry. Well, that's a, an, another real, uh, real issue that is happening in hospitals. But the bottom line is, remember, you're dealing with people who are stressed. Those nurses and techs, they want to do a good job. But instead of the way she handled it, even though obviously she was a stressed out caregiver who was terrified for her daughter being in pain, but maybe she would have had a more effective interaction and had that building rapport and having more of a positive relationship, if she paused, hit the pause button, take a deep breath, um, calm down a little bit, and then go out. We've been waiting for 20 minutes now for her shot. She is writhing in pain. She is groaning. How soon we know her shot is already past due. How soon can you give her that injection? That's being respectful, but it's also making it very clear that you're being assertive, but you're not being aggressive. You're not being rude. You're scared. And you could even say that I'm scared. I know she's in pain and I'm helpless. When can she get that shot? That last bullet there, show respect and expect respect. Again, we are humans talking to other humans. I'm looking at our time and underneath that, what we just talked about, how to build mutual understanding. There are some specific bullet points and they are um, tools that I know you've heard about or used before. And we talked about some of these, including in this section are several statements, uh, some quotes. Uh, that will help you through this. And again, this is part of your planning. Ask questions. Can you clarify what you mean by? Um, use phrases such as what you're saying is. Try to use non-threatening language and also just ask the questions. And the best questions start with who, what, when, where, how, but not why. And there's about 10 bullet points there, very helpful on this page that you can print off are how to find resources for caregivers, what area agencies on aging do, and then links to the other parts of our website. All right, now let's, let's open this up. Let's open this up for questions. Terms of Endearment is the name of the, of the movie. Thank you, Minerva. And it's Shirley MacLaine, and I can't think of her name. It's, it stops with Wagoner, but I can't remember her name. Uh, anyway, Terms of Endearment. You can probably get it on one of the streaming services. It's a very good movie, but it's definitely one of those that would help you understand. No, that's not the best way to do this. So questions, comments. And if you can't think on about questions right away, 
what one thing did you learn today or were you reminded of that you know you can use? Just type it in. What one thing do you think would was helpful today? I don't know how many of you we've lost. No, we still have some. I know for me, uh -huh. that being the courteous, my mom had a procedure recently and being her medical mm -hmm. power of attorney. attorney. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I re instead of biting their heads off, I remembered my mom's just not feeling good. Don't take it out on them and yeah. ask for whatever it is that mm -hmm. mom's needing. Mm -hmm. And with few exceptions, most people that are in the healthcare business, they do it because they want to make a difference. They want to help. They want to relieve pain. And they're stretched thin. There usually are not enough of them for the patients. Now, I realize we're talking uh, specifically about in the doctor's office, but it starts in the doctor's office, especially the, the um, relationship you build with the doctors and very often the physician assistants, you, maybe the ones you see in the hospital. Mutual understanding and just courtesy. And if that means you're too wound up, take a moment. There are many times I've gone into the bathroom for a few minutes and just breathe and focus on something and be grateful. That's another thing I've done in the last three months is I am so grateful that we have health insurance. I am so grateful that um, I have so much support I have. I'm so grateful that my husband sends me home when it starts getting dark. I've got one of those husbands. Okay. Uh, Thomas Britton says, we have created similar forms that we use for medications and medical history. It is very helpful to provide to triage personnel, uh, um, personnel at the beginning of the appointment. We usually offer a copy to them or ask if they would like to make a copy. Absolutely. Having a, a history or an archive, but make it brief. Bullet points. Don't you agree, Mr. Britton? Bullet points. Relevant information. Um, if you can provide dates when something happens, he also says it helps if someone other than me has to take my mother to doctors. Um, now, what do you mean by that? Is that just the shared responsibility of caregiver, of, of caregiving? Uh, uh, for the history, it uh, answers a lot of questions that maybe a doctor oh. may, may need and they may not know. They can look right. at the form and say it's right here on the form, shots, surgeries, whatever. Excellent. Yeah, provide as much, capture as much factual information as you can. My husband asked me to write a timeline for him. What I'm going to be using, and I'm glad we're having this discussion. If you've not heard of the Caring Bridge, C-A-R-I-N-G-B-R-I-D-G-E. I was aware of it. I had uh, known of other people that used it, but it was my daughter-in-law that suggested we do this. She set it up. It is a free service. You don't get uh, ads. You will get, um, now and then you'll get something that says a lot of people are benefiting from reading about your loved one. It would love They would love for you to donate, but it really is supposed to be about compact sharing uh, information. So you don't have to make those 14 phone calls or that's an exaggeration, but there are a lot of people you have to keep up. The caring bridge allows you, and sometimes it's me and sometimes it's my daughter-in-law, she's my editor, that you can write just a small amount or you can write a lot of information. What I'm doing with this caring bridge is it's going to be provide me a good way to do a timeline but also I'm going to be writing some blogs for our website. Um, and again, what, what have I learned? That's my purpose for sharing that information. What have I learned in the same way that this uh, communicating with health healthcare providers um, website is? We also encourage you that um, go to YouTube or go 
anywhere to our site and do some uh, do some research tips for communicating better um, forms whatever you need it's out there believe me it is out there to the right where it says blog categories checklists and templates that's very helpful fact sheets um, this information is provided to you I always tell people you have paid for the information on this website and you know how you have by your taxes. This is funded by federal, mostly federal and some state. Um, and there are two of us that are working on this. It also is um, the Han Healthcare on the Net. We are not experts on everything, but this particular area, I've become more of an expert than I think I would necessarily want to be. If you have other questions or comments, please. Um, send those through the website, uh, type it in the chat here. And again, what I'm attempting to do is uh, have someone from a hospital talk about what is the role of the, the caseworker, the care manager, the, they have social worker, they have a lot of different names. Learn the language, that's another tip. Learn the language of the offices that you deal with because I asked for a care manager at one of the rehab facilities. She didn't have a clue what I was talking about. So I had to go through the whole alphabet to come up with, oh, oh, that's what she's called. And then she knew what to do. So we have to learn their language, not the other way around. I hope this was helpful for you. And spend a little bit of time looking at these forms. Decide what you can, uh, what information would be helpful for you and what wouldn't be. The medication list, The uh, I just think having it typed is just so much more helpful because it's easy to update, very easy to update as opposed to handwriting it. And I have yet to see a doctor's office that didn't accept that piece of paper instead of having to write them all down. So again, I hope that was helpful. Does anybody have any questions or comments? I'll one, stay here as long as you need us. One thing I want to remind everyone when it comes to the medications, that doesn't mean just a prescription. If they're taking yes. any supplements or things like yes. that, also include those. Sometimes that can cause interactions. Absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up. And most of the lists actually have a section for that. Um, and this one, it, it, the bullet says medication and supplement list. That can make such a difference. If a physician doesn't know that they're taking a certain supplement, it can be it can mean that the, the medications they're taking that are prescribed are not working or they're having a, 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 an interaction that's not healthy. So absolutely, I'm glad you brought that up. It's not just medications. It's all the over over the counter drugs. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Minerva, again for all your support and help. And we will look forward to uh, talking next month. And we'll be talking about social workers and discharge planners and all those folks. Learn the language is what I found out in the last few months, especially. Bye, everyone. Take care.